Please stand for the reading of God's word. I'll be reading Hebrews 10, 19 through 25. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. You may be seated. Thank you, Mary. He is risen. Good, you still got it. One of my favorite things to do is come together with you guys on Sunday morning and spend time in God's presence worshiping and adoring Him. I mean, that, that's our choice, right? It doesn't matter how things go. It matters whether we choose to come together to worship Him. Well, as I was looking through this passage in Hebrews, it doesn't necessarily seem like an appropriate passage for Easter Sunday morning. I mean, provoke or, I mean, the scripture says, or spur one another. I don't know if either one's good. What? Today's not Easter Sunday? Yeah. You got it. You're getting ahead of me. But, to absolute, but today, last Sunday we celebrated Easter, but today is Easter Sunday in the Orthodox Church, right? But I, as Sarah said, I think Easter should be alive in us every day. Every day. I mean, if it's not, then, we aren't, then we're missing what God has in store for us, right? So I think we should celebrate it every day. But as I was reading through Hebrews, this passage jumped out at me. If you'll stick with me, the idea of provoking and spurring, we'll get to that. I think God has a message um, for us from that today. But you know, Hebrews is an interesting book. Did you guys know that? How many are real familiar with Hebrews? A few of you? It's, it, I mean, it, it's not written. The writing is different, and the, the way it's put together is different from uh, some of the other, uh, other letters. But it is full of meat. But I, I'm discovering in Hebrews, the meat is still on the bone. You know what I'm talking about? You have to work at it. It's not, it's not all cut in little pieces so that we can eat it easily. We have, to, we have to cut it off the bone, and we have to chew on it sometimes to really get what God is speaking to us through the through the writer of the Hebrews. Anyway, um, we're going to look through Hebrews today and see what God has to say for, to us through it today. Do you like when a passage begins with therefore, like this one does? It, it begins, therefore, brothers and sisters. What that means is something's getting ready to be ha- it's getting ready to happen, right? He's getting ready to tell us something. The previous verses set the groundwork for the great reveal, and this one's no different, although we have to work out a little bit to see it. But see, the first part of it talks about the Hebrew sacrificial system. You guys all understand that? Not really. I'm not going to try and take the time to explain today, but I mean, the whole idea of sacrificing animals for the forgiveness of sins doesn't make a lot of sense to us today. Suffice it to say, that's the way it was back then. That was the method that God gave them for providing forgiveness of sins and restoration in relationship with Him. But you see, it was never intended to be the end. It was just the means, because the end is what we're talking about today. The end is what we celebrate in Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed, right? This sacrificial system was never intended to be the permanent thing. It was just the temporary thing. It was, it was the interim thing until Jesus Christ came and, and put it all together. Um, the writer tells us that the sacrificial system of his time was inadequate because it had to be repeated year after year. It was something that had to continually be done, but when Christ came... When Christ came, he did once and for all what the sacrificial system did for a season. God tells us he does not delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice, but in what? What does God delight in? Obedience. Not just hearing what it says, but actually doing it. Jesus made that possible by becoming the once and for all sacrifice for our sins. 
Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence. Do you guys have confidence? Since we have confidence, here it is, to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. Today, we don't realize how radical this statement was for its time. I mean, we've lived with this truth for so many years, it doesn't really move us. The most holy place, or the holy of holies in the temple, was only accessible by the priest chosen to go in and present the sacrifice for the people. Now, uh, hear me. It was both a high honor and it was a terrible, fearful task. You see, if the priest was not worthy to present the sacrifice... Well, let's just say this is, this is true. They tied a rope to his ankle when he went into the Holy of Holies. You know why they tied an ankle, a rope to his ankle? Because if he wasn't worthy, guess what? And they did this by experience. This is, wasn't the first time. It had happened before, and they had to use the rope. I'd kind of hate to be on rope duty. So the priest had to go into the Holy of Holies with a rope tied to his ankle to make sure. You see, not all of them survived. So do you see the significance of this? Because of what Jesus did for us through his death, his sacrifice, we can enter the Holy of Holies, as Pastor Brian was talking about, without fear. Without fear. It was a fearful thing. They had to, it was a high honor and a fearful task, and not everyone survived it, so not everyone wanted to do it. It was a fearful thing, but because of what Christ did, we can enter without fear. The sacrifice was his blood. Jesus once and for all paid the ultimate sacrifice for us. But it continues. Not only into the Holy Holies, but by a new and living way through the curtain, which is his body. You may not know this, but there was also a curtain in the temple that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was, and that's where they made that ultimate sacrifice for the people. Um, so not only did they tie a rope to the ankle of the priest who went behind the curtain, they also put bells on the hems of his garment. So you can understand the significance of that. If the bell stopped for too long, they'd give a little tug on the rope. And if the bells didn't start up again, they could pull them out. The Holy of Holies was so sacred, not only was there, not only was, uh, there was a curtain across it, so not only did... The priest could only go in there with the, the rope and the bells, but they couldn't even see it. It was hidden from view. It was hidden from view. If you remember the story of Jesus' death on the cross, remember when he came to the end of his life on the cross and he yelled, It is finished. It says, At that point, the curtain, yes, this curtain was ripped from top to bottom in the temple. It was an earthquake, and it was a terrible, scary thing. Um, this is the new and living way through the curtain that the author is talking about. Uh, again, we've taken this for granted for so long, we don't often realize the significance of what happened here. You see, when that curtain was ripped in two, Jesus set the whole sacrificial system that they had relied on for hundreds and hundreds of years on its side. I mean, he totally threw it out. He totally wiped it out. Um, see, it was at this point that the, the old way was revealed for just what it was, a shadow, a symbol of what Jesus did for us. Do you get the significance of that? Because of what Christ did, we can enter the Holy of Holies boldly. And in fact, his body, his body became the curtain that was ripped in two that separates us from God and our ability to see him. And there's one more thing. It says, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, Jesus at this point took the role of being the high priest for the Hebrew nation and for all of us as well. You see, he is the one who can boldly walk through the curtain which is now ripped into the Holy of Holies. He doesn't have to have a rope tied around his ankle or bells on the hem of his garment. Jesus walks boldly in as our representative before God. In fact, the curtain itself was ripped in two because the Holy of Holies at this point became a living, breathing reality when Jesus rose from the dead. 
I'm sure they continued that, that system for a while, but it was ripped in two because of what Christ did. I, I told you guys, this is meat on the bone. This is, not, this is stuff that, and it's pretty cool. When we think about what it is that Jesus did for us. Well, since Jesus did this because of that, then let us draw near. Let us draw near to God. Do, do we really know what it means to draw near to God? See, again, think about how revolutionary this was. Back then, their only chance of getting connected with God was through the priest. And the Roman Catholic Church capitalized on that, and they continued for a while. The only way that you could get to God was through the priest and through the church. What is, the Scripture is saying is we don't need any intermediaries between us and God. We can step boldly, us, ordinary human beings, right into the Holy of Holies. Amen. We can draw near to God. Wow. Because Jesus is alive, we can draw near to God with a sincere heart. Do we have any idea today what sincerity means? I mean, what it really means? I mean, we live in an age of, of, of people being two-faced or looking out for number one, or there's got to be a catch or ulterior motives or, or say whatever you have to say to get what you want, right? That's the time that we live in. But we must draw near to God with a sincere heart. I looked it up in the dictionary. Yes, I have one of those. It sits on my shelf. It's a, it's a thing that has pages in it, kids. I didn't type it into my computer browser. Or look on my cell phone. Yeah. Sincerity means honest. Truthful, no hidden agendas. And I've added wholehearted, but I added this so secure that we can be ourselves. Are we sincere? You see, folks, we often try to come to God with all of our stuff, hiding behind these masks and with our agendas and all of that. But let me tell you this you, you, can't, you, you can't fool God. I mean, you can even you can fool yourself at least for this long, right? But if you can't fool yourself, you surely can't fool God. God knows your stuff better than you do, so we have to just dump it all out and come just as we are. If you come any other way, it's just not going to work. We have to come to God with a sincere heart, in full assurance of faith. Do you have assurance in your faith? In other words, are you sure that you're sure that you're sure? Do you know what I mean? Are you sure? <laughs> Do you know what it means to be sure? I, I mean really sure? This is the place that I find many people, especially and, and even some Christians, struggling. This was the place that was transformational for a guy named John Wesley. You know who he was? He's the, the parent of our church. The Methodist church and our church is from there. This was the turning point in John Wesley's life when all of a sudden, after being a minister for years, he was an Anglican priest and he loved Jesus, but he had never found assurance in his faith. This was the transformational. This was the turning point. This was the thing that, that turned him into the man that he became. Because of what Jesus did, you can have full assurance in your faith. If you don't, you can. See, that's a struggle I find with so many people who call themselves Christians out there. They have never come to the place of assurance. They come to the place of, well, I hope. I hope that I'm good enough. I hope that I've done enough. I, I hope that, that me doing whatever it is that I've done, the religious hokey pokey, or because I've, well, my parents were Christians. I've been, I was born in the church. I, I was dedicated. I, was, I mean, I was born on Wednesday and I was in church on Sunday. I've been there my whole life. That has to count for something. Not sure what. I mean, I'm that guy. My parents didn't even, my mom didn't even miss one Sunday. 
I've been in the church my whole life, but you know what? That didn't make me any more a Christian than sitting in a garage makes you a car. Or in a corral makes you a... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A farmer. If you aren't sure, you can be. You can be. He continues, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. This is how it takes place. The sprinkling of blood was an indication of purity and holiness. This tells us through Jesus' death and resurrection, we can have relief from a guilty conscience. Do you know how many Christians live this way? Guilty, defeated, beat down, fearful. It goes along with what we were just talking about. There are so many Christians who have truly asked Jesus to, to forgive their sins and invited him into their hearts who live this way, built, beat down, guilty, defeated. See, this is the greatest message of all at Easter. You want to hear it? Because Jesus paid the price, you are free. You're free. I mean, you can be. I'm not saying you will be. God forgive us for the times, like, like I said, we, we know that Jesus is alive and we live like someone stole his body. Do you understand? That, that was what the, the, the myth that they told, that Jesus didn't really rise. Someone just stole his body and, and they made up this thing about, about Jesus being alive. God forgive us for the time as his followers that we live that way. We don't live in the freedom. We don't allow his blood to cleanse us and make us holy. Because Jesus paid the price, we are free. Then, if you haven't been, you definitely need to be. The next part, having our bodies washed with pure water. Do you know what this is talking about? Any ideas? Baptism. Baptism. You know, baptism is one of those sacraments. What a sacrament is, is something that God has given us that we can do physically that affects us internally. It affects us in our heart. Um, baptism is one of the sacraments. And I can't tell you for how many people this becomes the moment, the X marks the spot, the place where assurance finds its anchor. There's a lot of people who say, well, I don't need to be baptized. I mean, that's just getting in the pool and, and getting dunked with water. If that's how you feel about it, guess what? It's absolutely true. But you see, baptism is more than just being dunked in the tub. The, it, it, there's some, um, some symbolism that's important. The reason that we immerse people, we believe that's, that's the, the way that, that, uh, that we should do it. I'm not stuck on that. I had one baptism service where I did all three forms of baptism just because of physical conditions, sprinkling, pouring, and dunking. But the significance of being dunked in the water is that we are buried with Christ. But you see, Christ didn't stay buried, right? right? And that's why, <laughs> what did Gail say? It was turkey. I was doing his baptism. He goes, Pastor said, I asked Pastor, how long do you... Do you hold them under? And he said, until the bubbles stop. <laughs> That's not the point. The idea is we are buried with Christ. Our old life is gone. In the Jewish faith, when the person came out into new life, they were considered a brand new person, and they gave him a new name. It was that significant. They were not the same person who went under because when they came out, they were brand new. This is the place. So I would encourage you, if you haven't been baptized, you should. I'm not saying that you have to. We know the thief on the cross wasn't baptized. And guess where he went? At least one of them went to heaven, right? But this is the place for so many people. Baptism is a place that not only is a testimony of what Christ has done, but it sets an anchor in your heart for your assurance. Boy, it's just been a whole lot of amen material going on here, huh? I've heard a few, thank you. 
I, I think today could be the day on Orthodox Easter Sunday for someone to really draw near to God. I, I think for someone today, it might click in your brain that you can have full assurance. I, I mean, it, it's just that point. All of a sudden, it just clicks. You know what I'm talking about? I, I want to see the big aha bubble go over your head. I want to see the light go on. Maybe this is the day. Well, since we have drawn near to God, since we have drawn near, let us hold. I like the way that did that. Let us hold unswervingly. <laughs> How many people do you know that are not walking the Christian life? They call themselves Christian, maybe are Christians, but are not walking the Christian life unswervingly. Do you know what I mean by that? I know we've talked about it before, but the best indicator is the swervometer. What? You've never heard of the swervometer? Well, let me tell you, it is an ancient tool used by holy men and women down through the ages to determine whether we are on track or not. The swervometer. Look it up. It's in Hezekiah. Well, I guess you could use a compass, too. How do you use the compass? You just point the needle at Jesus and keep it on him. It's as simple as that. Why is that not so simple as that? What is it in us that we struggle to keep it pointed? You know what I'm saying? If we knew that all we have to do is, is, is keep pointed at Jesus, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, we know that's true. We know that when we are in that mode that things are better. How come we don't do it? How come it's such a struggle? Because we're knuckleheads. At least some of us. Boy, I heard very few amens, but a few little hand, little, this could be me, could be me. <laughs> right, Aubrey? <laughs> At least got a response out of her anyway. Did you know that one degree off over the length of this sanctuary, it's not that big a deal, but just one degree off over a lifetime do you get it? There's a lot of people who say, well, you know, I, am, I have an A-plus average in my relationship with Jesus. I am 99% sold out. Where's that 1% going to get you over a lifetime? That's maybe an ouch and not an amen, right? We need to hold the needle on true north toward Jesus. See, we need to hold it to the hope that we profess. We can do this because he is faithful. You see, Jesus never swerves. He's always there. He's always there. He always will be because he is faithful. If he is not right in front of us, guess who swerved? Right? Well, I've got great news. Jesus made a way to help us on this journey. Us, each other, the church. What? That's it. You know what? That we are here today proves that it works. He hasn't failed yet. Right? Therefore, let us consider <laughs> how we can provoke one another toward love and good deeds. I've got to tell you today that provoking is not a spiritual gift. Although many of... Some people have it. Yeah, you know, I mean, there's provoking and... Then there's provoking. Where's Cameron? <laughs> Cody. Uh, don't give me that look. You guys know all about provoking, right? 
I don't need to spend much time defining what provoking is. I mean, you guys understand it, and some of you guys are really good at it. But I want to be clear, it is okay to provoke, to spur, to motivate, to encourage, to push, to guide, to lead, to direct, to help each other toward love and good deeds. Amen. Toward love and good deeds. That is the only context that matters. For those of us who are good at it, channel your energy in this direction. How do we provoke each other this way? Got any ideas? Encourage, pray, help, meet with, what? Pray with, by an example, by discipleship, never give up on people. One of my favorite, eat. Did you know you can learn a whole lot about someone when you eat with them? Huh? Mint chocolate chip ice cream. Eat that together, boy. Other things. What have we done today? Worship, worship together. Did you know there are some days when I don't feel like worshiping very much? But I can look out here occasionally and see someone worshiping. <laughs> We can spur each other on. We can provoke each Did you know we can provoke each other to good worship? I may not be in the mood for it, but if somebody else is worshiping God, I can go, wow. If they can worship God, I can worship God. I'm not talking about being demonstrative. I'm talking about worshiping God, right? Also, it says, do not give up meeting together. You know, COVID did a couple of good things for us. It showed us how important it is to have human contact, how much we really need it. More important than just contact with other human beings, but is to be in a place where we can actively worship together. I mean, it's great to worship God by yourself. There's an element where we need to do that. But something incredible happens when we worship together. I've got to tell you that it can't be duplicated by watching on TV or live streaming. I understand that's necessary from time to time, but there's nothing like it. For some, I mean, Holy Spirit can work through the airwaves. And he does, but not the same way when we're together. We just need Jesus with skin on sometimes. But it says, don't forsake assembling together as some are in the habit of doing. That's the other side of it. Some people have got out of the habit. It's convenient to sit at home in their pajamas. But we really, really do need each other. And we mentioned this before. Let us encourage one another. It's the last part today. Encourage one another. Um, I, I have to admit, we do pretty good at the other side of that, don't we, sometimes? We, we discourage pretty well, but we must. No, no, I mean we must. I mean we absolutely must get good, really good at this part. We can talk about all, all the other things that we can do to provoke and, 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 and spur each other on. But man, it, encouraging is the most important part. You know, it doesn't take a lot to encourage someone. Sometimes it's just saying, hi, how are you doing? Acknowledging that they're here. A, a gentle pat on the shoulder, a hug, a handshake, a smile. Or when God lays on your heart, you, you give them a phone call or send them a text. Or take them some mint chocolate chip ice cream. I mean, you know, I just, whatever, whatever. Encouraging each other. Th did you know that encouragement is a spiritual gift? So those of you who've got the spiritual gift of encouragement, you need to take the spiritual gift inventory, and if not, make sure you do. I know it doesn't work that way, but if you've got it, we desperately need you to be encouragers. And if you don't have the spiritual gift of encouragement, guess what? You can still encourage. You can. We must. We have to. We all can be encouragers.
Because when we encourage each other, we build each other up. Jesus is risen. Is he? The challenge for us today, we're going to move into our prayer time in just a few moments. We're going to have the praise team go ahead and come. And, and we're going to spend time. The altars will be open. I don't, I don't know what needs you have in your life. This is our, our prayer time. and um, You're welcome to come and spend time kneeling around these altars. They just represent the foot of the cross. I don't know about you, but it's a special place for me. Maybe that's not comfortable. You can pray in your pews, obviously. But we want to spend time praying. But the challenge for us all today is this. Go forth and provoke each other in love and good deeds.